Um, it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Byron Kenneth Williams, who has traveled here from DC area. Dr. Williams earned his MS in statistics from CSU. His PhD is also in, uh, from CSU, where he worked on natural resource ecology and management. What I know behind the scenes, which I won't hold against him, he has, a, it says range science there. <laughs> Ken has been deeply involved for many years in developing frameworks and strategies for the integration of natural resource science and management. He has been a faculty member and the leader of the Vermont Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at the University of Vermont. He then transitioned to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where he held several important positions. First, as chief of the branch of biometrics and technical services at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. Huge connection of, of the folks here with the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. <coughs> then, as he, he held a position as chief of the Office of Migratory Bird Management. Finally, still with the Fish and Wildlife Service, he was the executive director of the North American Waterfowl and Wetlands Office. He then took the position as chief of the USGS Cooperative Research Units. This position supervises all the co-op units, of which, if, I, if the website was correct, there are now 40 units, um, not exactly 40 states, because Montana still has units at two different universities. But it's been a, a, a wildly successful program. In that position, he supervised David Anderson. And I do remember Dave saying when he became the, the chief, it's like, this is going to be wonderful. I don't know if it was, was it? <laughs> Probably for him. <laughs> Peachy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, anytime you're the boss of David Anderson, it's peachy, yeah. <laughs> um, fortunately for the wildlife profession, he then took the job of chief, chief executive office of the, of the uh, Wildlife Society. And, and, he, and he did really great things. I had a chance to interact with, with him and, and meet him a little more because the department heads had a group meeting association that he would come and talk to quite a bit. He got the chance to see how, why he's effective at what he, is, at what he does. He's transitioned now to where he consults for Renewable Resource Associates, specializing in investigating analysis and management of ecosystems and renewable natural resources. Dr. Williams is going to talk about the influence on the USGS cooperative units and wildlife profession. That's, that's the sort of title, but he's going to talk about uh, a lot more. Oh, this will uh, immediately advance. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, how about it? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Too loud? Yeah. Not loud enough. <laughs> okay. We'll here, let me back up just a minute. No sense in shouting at you. Um, let's see. Ken asked me, he gave me some fairly loose directions. He asked me to talk about Dave's career. From the, uh, from the point of view of my role as uh, in the cooperative research units and the Wildlife Society before getting a little more technical on some management issues, which I intend to do. Um, I should mention that about half my career uh, has been mostly management with some science. And uh, the other half has been mostly science with some management. And Dave, Dave always seemed to appreciate the mostly science part. We were good to go on the mostly science part. But he definitely arched an eyebrow at the administration management part, which he thought just basically flew a little too close to the evil bureaucratic, bureaucratic flame. So, so uh, uh, my first contact with Dave actually was here. Actually, my first contact with Dave uh, and with, uh, with Ken Burnham was, uh, was here uh, when I was a graduate student at CSU in the, uh, in the late 70s. By the way, I just found out today that that Dave was only two years older than I was. Now you see, if I'd known that, 
I would have thought of him more as a colleague than as a guru and a wizard. And it would have changed our relationship. I didn't know that. I thought, well, you know, what are you going to do? My, uh, my, anyway, my first contact with them was when I was a graduate student here. At the time, Dave was essentially terrorizing the Fish and Wildlife Service editorial office in Aylesworth, just uh, about a block from here, as he and his colleagues were trying to finish their famous band recovery monograph. And the, uh, and the, the non-scientist editors of the editorial office were trying to copy edit his document. How do you think that went? My, uh, my wife, Jeannie, was working in the editorial office at the time, and so I heard all about how it went. Uh, I was finishing a PhD in range science at the time, which for some reason Ken Wilson finds amusing. Now, oh, oh, but I, I will say that uh, with some authority that the monograph that those guys are working on would never be confused as a range science product, at least not at that time. Now, Ken, you may not believe that, but it's true. The, uh, uh, some, years, uh, some years later, after Dave had moved here uh, as unit leader, and I had taken a position as unit leader at the University of Vermont, we both somehow managed to incur the wrath of the chief of, of the National Cooperative Research Units Program, Barry, you know who he was, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and he put a target on both Dave and me for reasons that neither one of us could understand. Uh, and, uh, but, but the very fact that I was targeted at the same time he was did give me some added credibility with, uh, with Dave. That was a good thing. And it made for some interesting conversations about how weird that chief must be to not like a couple of sweethearts like us. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, during, the, uh, during that time, Dave and colleagues were busy creating uh, the methodological infrastructure, in my estimation, for fish and, uh, fisheries and wildlife science as we know it as a discipline, while I was busy trying to bootstrap a new and underfunded unit in Vermont. Uh, from the East Coast, I was, uh, I was able to watch what was happening out here as he did that. I watched, for example, when he snagged Ken Burnham. Uh, Ken had previously been with the Western Energy and Land Use team. And, uh, uh, and, and that's where I first, uh, first met him. And Ken's talents at Wheelett were, to put it mildly, not optimally utilized. Would you say that's true, Ken? Yes, I think you would. Then, then I saw him work to get Gary White here from Los Alamos National uh, uh, Lab, uh, and then transform the, uh, the Colorado unit from the sleepy outfit I knew it to be when I was here uh, in graduate school, uh, school into the powerhouse that it later became. Later on, in uh, over 16 years as chief of the Cooperative Research Units Program, I watched the unit brain trust of Dave and Ken and Gary and the other unit staff and the postdocs and the graduate students and the, uh, the technical support people and all the rest of it uh, turned this unit into the most visionary and productive ever in the, in the, uh, the co-op units program. I saw him get the recognition that he deserved as a federal scientist. I, uh, I saw him promoted to the rare and prestigious rank of federal senior scientist. Thereafter followed by Ken Burnham who received that same promotion the co-op unit thereby being distinguished as the only unit ever in the, uh, in the history of the co-op unit system to have two senior scientists as unit members. Congratulations, Ken. Congratulations, Dave. I saw both men get the most prestigious award bestowed in our profession, the Aldo Leopold Award, and then followed it by watching Gary White also get the Leopold Award. Uh, it always seemed to me that Colorado State's, uh, it was Colorado State's uh, uh, profound good fortune that Dave got crossways with the, uh, with the Utah State University in the 80s and moved here to take over the Colorado unit. Over my 40 years in the business, I watched Dave's scientific stature grow steadily into the world-class reputation with which he is held today. Uh, and I watched the people in Dave's ambit uh, at both USU and at CSU, including many of the scientists in this room today, contribute as much as any group ever has to the maturation of wildlife biology as a science-based professional discipline. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations to all of you. Obviously, obviously, as the National Chief of the Cooperative Research Unit, I took great pride in it and following the time-honored tradition of administrators and bureaucrats everywhere, I took full credit for it. 
But that's enough for the accolades. That's all I'm going to say. I want to get now into some technical stuff. Now, you haven't had any real technical shot. This is going to be a, a kind of a slap across the face here. In my remaining time, I want to discuss some key research challenges where Dave's impact was seminal, but perhaps underappreciated. And uh, it'll have to be a fairly fast go to stay within the time frame. So my apology to start with, let's get, uh, let's get on with it. See if this will work. How do I do it? There? OK, I want to talk about four basic challenges. I'm going to stand over here so I can see this thing. I want to talk about four basic uh, longstanding challenges in resource management that really have bedeviled all of us for generations. The first one is accounting for future consequences of decision making, something we always talk about and we almost never do. Second challenge, accounting for uncertainty about the processes that influence change, i.e., recognizing what we know and what we don't know and folding that into our decision making while we're doing it. Number three, accounting for an inability to fully observe biological resources. If ever there is a, a, a problem that faces wildlife and natural resource ecology, this is it. When was the last time any of you worked on a, a natural resource system in which you could see the system entire and be sure you were seeing all, all of it? It doesn't happen. So the question is, how do you recognize what you can see and what you can't see? and fold that into your decision-making process intelligently. Last question. The, 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 the bane and the scourge of the, of the 21st century, uh, uh, non-stationarity in the world of climate change, large-scale landscape uh, uh, change, uh, urbanization and exurbanization, uh, 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 habitat fragmentation and all the rest of it, this is the world in which we live. The question is, what do we do about it in a, in a management context? Those are four pretty big questions, and they're questions that have been with us for a long time, questions that are growing in their impact. I want to say something about how I want to kind of knit those things together, and I want to talk about Dave's seminal role in pushing us into the future. You with me so far? Okay. So let's start with the first one, long-standing long challenges in resource management. And I'll start with this paper. Nobody's mentioned this paper yet. But this is a very important paper, 1975 Ecology, Optimal Exploitation uh, Strategies. The exploitation he's talking about is sport hunting. The, uh, the animal population consisted of mid-continent mallards. The environment was fluctuating wetland conditions on the breeding grounds. The biological situation was one of interacting population, uh, population and wetlands dynamic, and the theory was dynamic programming. That's what he covered in that paper in 1975, and it was the first paper, as far as I know, in which it was fully developed, fully analyzed, fully theoretized, and laid out, uh, laid out the consequences of, uh, of, of this, uh, this long-term issue. Here was his framework. He was looking at resource systems that change through time, influenced by management actions and environmental conditions through time, with, uh, with those uh, influences pushing the resource system to a new state into the future where it's subject to new management actions, new environmental conditions, and so on into the future. That was his framework. And he, uh, and he then considered, see if I can get back to it. Well, now, wait a minute. I knew this would happen. He, 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 uh, he considered it being subjected to environmental variation, which then, uh, which then infused a stochastic structure in those system dynamics, actually a Markovian uh, structure in those, uh, in those dynamics. Here was the elements of the system Dave looked at. He was looking at observed, uh, observed states that change through time, actions that change through time, policy that, uh, describing state-based actions through time, Markovian transitions, rewards that, uh, that uh, are accrued to actions taken when the process is, is, in, state, uh, is in, a, in a particular state, and triples of uh, observed states, actions, and rewards through time. Here was the influence diagram that basically he used. Where that, uh, that shows observed states uh, influencing actions through policy, with actions and states uh, influencing, uh, uh, influencing uh, uh, rewards and policy transitions, and so on the system goes. That was his system. That was the one that underlay the paper of 1975. We good, Jim? Does it make sense? You've seen it before. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the policy valuation that led, to uh, that led to those policies was based upon a value function that simply 
uh, accumulated return, uh, re uh, rewards through time, discounted, uh, discounted into the future, which could be expressed in terms of immediate, uh, immediate rewards and future values. The value optimization simply optimized over all the possible policies that are available and could be broken into a two-part optimization, one part of which optimized the future uh, 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 given the present, and then the present given the optimal future. This is the, the, the recursive approach of dynamic programming. That's all that amounts to, and that's what Dave used. The optimal policy was just simply the policies, the, the actions that were identified by that optimization. The decision making in the context of dynamic programs, I say here was a comprehensive policy, uh, uh, modeling, evaluation, policy, interpretation for optimal harvest uh, of Micon and Mallards. It was the first, as far as I can tell, in our business to give a full treatment of theory and applications to a dynamic ecological system. Dave opened the door with this paper. He opened the door. And then having opened it, he turned his attention elsewhere. And he went on to estimation. and. Uh, and model, uh, modeling choice and prediction and all the other things that you've heard about the, uh, this morning. But having opened that door, he left it uh, for others to rush on through it and to expand the framework, which a lot of people did. And the, one of the ways they did it was to turn to that second big issue of uncertainty about the process of influencing change. How did he do that? By simply taking his framework and adding one more uncertainty factor, which is the uh, structural uncertainty factor about, uh, about uh, uh, processes, limited understanding of resource dynamics, expressed here in terms of uh, models, K models, each with their, uh, with their own uh, model likelihood arranged in a model state Q. Policy would, uh, was identified then in terms of uh, actions based on both resource state and model state, expanding the framework. The presence of model uh, uncertainty, by the way, if this looks familiar to you, it should, is what's called adaptive management. So Dave was what the work that Dave did was a precursor to everything that's happened in adaptive management basically since then in natural resource, uh, uh, natural resource conservation and management. The elements of that adaptive process, resource states just as before, actions just as before, resource state transitions just as before, what's new is model uncertainty and model state, the organization of those model, uh, model uncertainty factors into a model state and then model transitions that are provided by way of a Bayesian update based upon observed system state. The adaptive, uh, uh, the adaptive valuation that, uh, that, uh, that produced optimal policy was based on model-specific rewards, which were averaged. Model-specific value, value functions, which were averaged. And then value optimization, which optimized over all available, uh, all available policies, again in terms of a two-part dynamic programming optimization just as before. Now, if you compare that one, that value, that valuation, to the valuation that Dave used, you can see those two side by side and you can see what just happened. The, the state-based optimization, Optimization based upon arguments, uh, uh, state arguments, has now been expanded, and the uh, and the ba uh, the uh, uh, the argument for optimization now includes not only resource state but also model state. And boy, does that make a difference! That expands big time the problem that you're facing in trying to solve these problems. But it can be done, and people have been working on it for years. These are some of the things that people have been working on for those years. Many people in this room have been working on some of these problems. Passive and, adaptive and active adaptive management, single and double loop learning, identifying key sources of structural uncertainty, pattern analysis in uh, uh, adaptive uh, policies and values, co uh, computing approaches, all manner of resource applications, stakeholder involvement, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. We've had now about 35 years of people working on this stuff. Lots of progress has been made. There's a lot yet to be done. And it all was built on Dave's seminal contribution. Let's move on to the third. The third one is the inability to fully observe biological resources. This is what we deal with every single day as, uh, as uh, natural resource managers and, some, and biologists. We're always trying to figure out what the state of the system is so that we can base smart decisions on that, uh, on that state. Here's the framework. It's the same as Dave's framework. It adds a new, uh, a new uh, uh, uncertainty factor, partial observability, uh, in which uh, resource status has to now be characterized in terms of probabilities, 
that are organized into a belief state with management actions tied to belief states rather than the unobserved resource, resource states, with modeling that produces uh, observations that are related to but not the same thing as system state. And boy, isn't that great. Kim, what'd you do? Okay, here we go. And, uh, and Bayesian updates of belief states. Here's, uh, here are the elements, same as before. Same resource states, same actions, same Marco uh, Markovian transitions, same rewards, all the same as before, all the same as what Dave did, all the same as we do in adaptive. What's new are observations and their linkages to resource state and policies that are driven by uh, 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 beliefs rather than, uh, rather than states and triples of observations, actions, and rewards through time. Here's the, incident, uh, the, uh, the uh, influence diagram that shows that. States, uh, states and beliefs are linked through observations. Uh, the uh, 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 actions are produced by, uh, by uh, 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 policy. Um, actions and, uh, and resource states produce, uh, produce uh, rewards and produce transitions to, uh, to, uh, to states in the future, which are linked to observations, which, are then, which then, uh, are used to update beliefs uh, uh, into the future, and so on the system goes, time by time by time. Observations are the new wrinkle Ca uh, captured in terms of belief states. You with me, Jim? We okay? Okay. I, I keep looking. He knows this. He knows all this stuff, so I got to make sure he's not. If his brow's wrinkled, I'm worried. The, the, uh, uh, the structure, same as before with the, uh, with the Markovian transitions. Here's the observation model uh, and the linkages to system state, and here are the, uh, the, uh, the uh, belief states, which are then updated by Bayesian updates based upon observations. Average rewards, which produce policy, are given by an average of rewards. Value function, that again, just simply accumulates discounted uh, uh, rewards, which can be written in terms of immediate rewards and future rewards, same as before. Value optimization, again, the two-part two optimization, the future given the, uh, given the present, then the present given the future. And if you compare that one to what Dave did, this is how it looks. It's an amazing comparison of those two. There is one very big difference. The very big difference is that, a, that, uh, that the discrete uh, uh, resource states have been replaced by continuous multi-vector belief states. And boy, does that make a big difference in the way you have to analyze these things to find solutions. But it can be done. People have been working on it for about 30 years. There are two very interesting extensions on this that are important for our business. One of those handles states, some states that are fully observable, and some states that are not. Uh, for example, habitat that you can see, population status that you can't. Transitions for both are seen, are, are, can be written in terms of uh, those joint probabilities and the appropriate observation function. Uh, with a, a little bit of simplification, you can come out, you, uh, you can derive uh, uh, belief state uh, transitions, once again using Bayesian updates based upon future observations. And if you look at that carefully and you close one eye and squint at it, you can see that if you eliminate the Y variable, you've got Dave Anderson's uh, MDP. If you squint the if you close the other eye and squint at it in the other way, uh, eliminating X produces a, uh, a, a partially observable Markov decision process. So this approach here of mixed observability literally gives us both combined. So it becomes possible for us to analyze systems in which we can fully observe some important parts of it that change through time, and we can partially observe other parts of it that change through time. There's our answer, James. We've been worrying about this for a long time. Here's uh, the second extension that I think is very interesting. Adaptive management itself can be written in terms of mixed observability. Let Y represent an uncertain transition model with, belief, with its own belief state and observations restricted only to the observable system state. Uh, in that case, the transition probabilities can, uh, uh, for, that, for that model can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in simplified terms, as I show here, and the optimal value function simply becomes, once again, that two-part dynamic optimization, uh, uh, dynamic programming optimization. And if you compare that to adaptive management, 
as I described a few minutes ago, you can see that they are exactly the same thing. In other words, adaptive management is a mixed partial observability model, which means that par uh, partially observable Markov decision processes can be brought to bear in our analyzing adaptive, uh, adaptive management, which is a really, really big deal because there's such a beautifully developed uh, 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 methodology for it. So let's set that one aside and we'll go on to the last problem, non-stationary resource dynamics. Consider treating it in this way, that there are probabilities of transition from one model to another, from a prior model to a posterior model, and transitions uh, uh, for that posterior model from one, uh, from, uh, from one state to another. Multiply those two probabilities together, consider two specific uh, uh, models, y and y prime, giving us a value function, average over the posterior model, then average over the prior model, and lo and behold, you get an, a, a value optimization that yet again is tied, uh, is tied to a two-part optimization according to dynamic programming, in which you optimize the future first, given the present, then the present, given the future, with optimal policy identified by that, op uh, by that value optimization problem. A comparison of, of, uh, of this value optimization and the value optimization that is for stationary values, if you look at those two together, you can see pretty clearly what has just happened. What has just happened is that, that uh, non-stationarity requires an extension of uh, a yet another belief state to the value function. One has only one belief state, the one on bottom. The other has two belief states that are a part of the function arguments. And you have now greatly, greatly complicated this problem. It probably eliminating our ability to deal with it except for specific cases in point that are important to us. And more important, maybe, to us all is that it provides a theoretically defensible framework for us to think about non-stationarity as we try to manage natural resources. So there are, are my big four. Uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of looking into the future and trying to manage for it. The idea of limited understanding about dynamic processes, the idea of not being able to see the system entire as you're trying to manage it, the idea of tr facing up realistically to non-stationarity, which is the future we all face from this point forward. Those four problems, all four of those four problems, have been developed based on the seminal work that Dave Anderson did. So hats off to Dave. Now, there's more. The more is that we have, we have the uh, concern about how to include partial observability and structural uncertainty in the same model, how to deal with continuous state in action spaces. Ken, you did it again. Oh, okay. Ken W. Oh, wait. Ken Wilson. Okay. Dealing with, uh, dealing with deep uncertainty in which you simply do not have any idea of what the, uh, what the probability structure for, uh, for system status is. Uh, this one, by the way, can, is uh, I'm, I'm hearkening to, I'm getting to, I'm relating to in the spirit of uh, uh, Ben Aim's uh, 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 info gap, uh, including internal and external monitoring sources, including, uh, uh, including uh, uh, resilience with decision analysis, model free assessment in the spirit of, uh, of, of uh, resi uh, reinforcement learning, adaptive institutional learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the bottom line on all of this. Dave gave us a glimpse about how natural resource science can be fully embedded in resource management, which is an issue that ultimately we have to deal with. D others, others, after he got us started and turned his attention elsewhere, others opened that door wider to reveal a new management landscape and a start for its exploration. There's a whole lot here to build on, about 30 or 40 years worth of work that is out there and available to us with a framework somewhat like this one. Uh, and much, uh, much more can be done to contribute to that exploration and ultimately to reap the badly needed resource benefits. Make no mistake, we wouldn't be where we are in natural resources, in natural resource management, natural resource ecology, 
in trying to manage and conserve our natural resources that are under such threat right now. We wouldn't be where we are with the framework we have in place right now to deal with those urgent problems if it were not for Dave Anderson. Thank you, Dave Anderson. Ken Wilson, that's all I got. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. If we had time, I was going to ask you why we don't use that to model the presidency of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I've got> <laughs> 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 